Alrighty race fans, welcome to another edition of My Favorite Parts. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at chassis. We're going to be talking about the major different uh, chassis that are out there that are my favorites, not necessarily your favorites, but my favorites. Um, if I uh, don't talk about yours, don't be offended, but we'll talk about why these things uh, are what they are, what is important about them, and the guide pins on these. So let's get into it. All right, as we discussed in the opening, we're going to take a look at a number of uh, popular slot car chassis and talk specifically about the chassis and the guide pins. Um, in future episodes, we're just going to kind of work our way back through the cars and uh, we'll get into more of that later. But anyway, um, there's going to be some things I'm not going to talk about, so if I don't talk about your favorite chassis, don't be offended. But these right here have been, you know, very popular chassis. We have a lot of service parts for them, so they are my favorite parts. Anyway, so uh, we'll start off with the uh, Viper Scale Racing chassis. As you can see there, it's a complete car. And I'm going to use some terms that I kind of make up myself. They're probably not industry standards, but um, I consider the Viper chassis as sort of a semi-monocoque chassis. And the reason why I say that, it is not, uh, you know, monolithic in a way. We'll, we'll have a couple other examples of ones that are. But the Viper chassis, as it comes, you have three pieces. You have the base chassis itself. You have the bulkhead, which uh, is the uh, piece that the uh, end bell goes against and then the motor magnets go against and then all that gets down to the chassis and the clip that kind of holds everything in. And a lot of cars, you know, have some sort of clip that, uh, you know, holds their stuff together and we will examine those here in a minute. But anyway, uh, I say semi-monocoque because primarily everything is a unified structure for the exception of the bulkhead. And there's a lot of cars out there that are like this. A couple examples, uh, you, Super G Plus goes back um, to the 90s with that. Uh, BSRT Scale Auto has one just about exactly like this. Um, the new uh, Wizard uh, Fusion chassis is uh, what I would consider, you know, a set up like this, a semi-monocoque, and then the new uh, uh, chassis from RPMs, the, uh, the gray, like gray Ghost, I believe. Um, it's set up like that. All right, so it's because of that, um, it's, not, it's not very flexible laterally, which is good. Um, the, we'll get down here to the lifelike M chassis. This would be more of a monocoque where everything just plops right into that chassis. And as you can see, how all these parts just kind of drop in. This is the last piece that goes on. This is not a structural, structural member. This is a flux collector. Okay. And the Wizard Storm chassis would be another good example of a monocoque chassis where everything just goes right down into the car. These monocoques, the semi-monocoques, are easy to put together. Now, um, in future episodes, we'll talk about magnets and different strengths of magnets. But uh, for right now, uh, and I think we'll talk about when you get really strong magnets that, you know, the chassis is somewhat the spring, but if you have very strong magnets and, the, and they're pulling down on the track, the, the chassis will flex. So like in the Viper line, we have uh, stiff and super stiff chassis, or excuse me, firm and stiff chassis, which are, uh, you know, uh, glass loaded that uh, prevent the car from flexing underneath a high magnetic load. But normally, on most of your um, common grade stuff, it's just a nylon or some other similar product. So then Super 7, uh, it's pretty much a semi-monocoque. There's no bulkhead. The uh, motor already has the end bell uh, in, in the assembly. And here again, because you have the uh, bulkhead back there, the, the chassis doesn't have very much lateral flex. And we're making this in one stiffness because we don't, uh, we don't. 
This is not intended to be a high magnet car like the Viper, so you don't need to have the super stuff. Um, you get on down to things like uh, Bulldog, SRT, Turbo. Here again, it's a semi-monocoque um, where your rear bulkhead's part of the chassis and uh, the motor box just fits in. And we take a look at Tyco 440. Now Tyco 440 uh, is a double bulkheaded car and this is when you start to get into trouble with uh, high magnet applications and because of the way this works these bulkheads are not affixed to the chassis so you can get a lot of lateral flex okay now granted what I'm doing is probably more exaggerated than what the car experiences in uh, actual practice, but the problem with the 440, once you start adding really powerful traction magnets, as that car is going around a corner, it has a lot of lateral flex like this. The, the chassis is flexing, and that causes handling issues. And that to get rid of that, you have to take and put micro screws into the side of the chassis and screw into the bulkheads to tighten all that up. And that's a real, real um, troublesome operation. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So. For high magnet applications, 440 is not your friend. Um, get back to life like M. Everything just drops into the top, which makes it pretty easy to assemble. Life like T chassis, um, you know, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, it's kind of an animal to itself, but for lack of a better description, we'll call it a monocoque. Everything just, just plops right into it. Um, there are no service parts really available much for T chassis in terms of extra motors or extra chassis, things like that. And then we get down to Wizard Storm. Um, actually, I, you know, kind of like this car. Uh, it was real simple to work on. Um, everything just loaded right into the top. Um, pretty intuitive. Uh, the cars really, I think, were very robust and uh, relatively easy to uh, make them go well and go fast and handle well. Um, just quite honestly, and I'll say it in public, the fusion is not one of my favorite parts because it's just very complicated in terms of the electrics uh, it takes to make those cars uh, work. There's been a number of reports from people where they get the cars running good and then in the middle of a race the electrics go away and they, uh, they don't have a good day. So it's relatively complicated and there's a very in my opinion, a very narrow, a narrow focus of users for that particular chassis. But Wizard Storm has had a history of being a very widely used chassis, a lot of clubs, um, hobby shops, or whatever. So it's, it's a really robust, robust situation. All right. So within that, then you have guide pins. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I've had cars that have come across the workbench where people just try to cram any guide pin uh, into it that they have laying around. That's not necessarily the case. Um, the Viper uses a guide pin that actually kind of dates back to um, Tomy SRT, Turbo, and Super G+. And those two cars actually got some of their design cues off of uh, uh, the Aurora uh, AFX Magna Traction and G Plus chassis. So the guide pin, as it sits in this car, okay, and, and there is a couple things when designing a guide pin. You have the diameter of the shank that's down inside here, uh, and then the space between these two flanges. That's really what holds it in. So that design convention, uh, Super 7 uses the same basic design convention. Uh, Tomy Turbo obviously uses that. Bulldog uses that. And if you get into your Wayback Machine, you can even use these guide pins in Magna Traction. Okay. Um, also too, then that would be the same thing for uh, Aurora or excuse me, uh, Auto World's uh, extraction chassis. You can use metal guide pins in them. So it's, it's a very common guide pin. All right, so then you get into Tyco. 
Uh, the basic Tyco guide pin is rather cheap. Um, some of them were made in aluminum, some of them were made in steel. Most all of them were, for the most part, were steel, but you, you can have some aluminum guide pins now and then. Because this flange is not very large, the guide pin is kind of wiggly. Okay, so you can see right there how much that guide pin wiggles. So as you try to build a performance chassis off of a 440, having that guide pin wiggle, when that car gets into a turn, this could be um, cause odd handling because this pin may or may not move the same way every time in every, in every turn. It has to be tight. Uh, so we do have a, a professional grade guide pin that we developed for Tyco 440, and if you noticed, it has a larger flange. So, you know, this has become one of my favorite parts because it fixes this problem with 440. Now, this pin does not fit in these other ones over here that we've talked about because the diameter of the shank down inside and then the spacing of these two flanges right in here, okay, it's different than this basic Tomy design. Lifelike M-Car, this is an animal unto itself, okay? The way this car was designed, the guide pin actually holds in the front axle, okay? This was actually part of, uh, I believe, Jim Russell's patent for the M-Car. Um, it's designed to sit and give the car a bit of suspension, for lack of a better description. So this guide pin, it's the only one like it on planet Earth. If you look at that, it's uh, basically got double flanges. So if you lose this or break this in your M chassis, good luck finding more because nobody makes this. Um, it would be relatively easy to do this for me, but with the minimum order quantities that, that are required today for these parts, you, you, you know, they'd bury the parts with me. I'd have so many of them left over. So um, this is one of the things that uh, makes uh, the M car a little difficult to uh, maintain is trying to keep a couple of these different things. Uh, T chassis, they basically just took a piece of uh, rod and just crammed it into the, the plastic and it's friction fit. Um, every now and then somebody calls me up, they've broken the pin out and whatever, and I'm like, well, th this was never a spare part, so just find some, scrap one off of eBay and, you know, switch all your parts over. And we get down to the wizard, and here again, the wizard pin due to the size of the shank down inside and then the spacing of these um, flanges. This pin is proprietary to the Wizard. Okay, it won't fit in any of these other platforms. I've seen people cram other pins into these and this pin into other stuff, and it's, it's questionable at best. So the Wizard does take its own guide pin. So when you're building your cars, you know, understand this relationship of uh, the chassis, uh, what parts uh, translate over, uh, in particular guide pins, because that's actually an important thing. Um, it's not, it's not a, uh, an arbitrary thing. Uh, talk about one, one more chassis here. Um, a Tyco turbo hopper, or in this particular case, I think it was uh, the Bandit four-wheel drive. They made a, uh, a couple of different things where they had large wheels and they had the, because of the way the, uh, the size of the wheels, the car sits up very high off the track. So they had to make extended travel shoes and they had a special extended length guide pin. Okay, it was just something that was, uh, you only find on turbo hoppers and these uh, off-road pickup trucks. So I don't have any of these extended pins right here at all. I don't know of anybody else that does. Uh, it's possible uh, Slot Car Central might, but uh, I certainly don't. Uh, shoes, we have long travel shoes. That's not that big of an issue. So, all right, so that kind of covers the basics of chassis uh, and guide pins, and we will move on to other parts of uh, these cars in probably the next video we'll talk about electrics.